Hello, welcome to Nine Lessons of Carols for Curious People, or as it was on the night of the 12th of December, for socially distanced people. Uh, for those of you who don't know, every single year we put on various live shows where we mix astronauts and scientists and comedians and musicians, and normally we have a live audience in front of us. Uh, but for this, obviously, during the year of the pandemic, uh, we basically had uh, a live audience dotted around the world. We gained, I think, another continent because we had scientists and communicators in every single continent. I think we gained another continent uh, in the next clip you're going to see. We certainly had, uh, for the first time, Canada uh, on the show. And uh, we're joined by Chris Hadfield. And after Chris Hadfield, we then also have the all-star Christmas carol. I'm not even going to tell you who's on, but you see if you can name every single person. But we had some of uh, the biggest names in the world in terms of acting and comedy. So uh, I hope you enjoy that. Anyway, our <laughs> next, uh, uh, was well, not our next form, our next astronaut, uh, and I can say that because there are more than two astronauts on tonight as well. There's a, a total of four uh, astronauts later on, Helen Sharman and Samantha Christopheretti. Uh, but this is uh, the first person that I think I've, I've worked with in a, in a show like this, and uh, since then I now go out to Toronto as well and do this fantastic show. I don't know if you can see Generator every single year. Uh, we do uh, a show together, and hopefully there will be one next year. It's been postponed, but with luck there will be. Uh, please welcome to the screen you are watching on now. Come on, Chris Hadfield. Hi, Chris, how are you? Here. There we go, Robin, I love that shirt you're wearing. Can you see and hear me okay? Yeah, I can see you, per and don't worry, you are not the first person to have the mute button sit scenario. We have had quite a few of those, so you join an illustrious crowd of scientists as well. How is everything? Uh, everything's great, thank you. Busy as can be, uh, involved in a lot of different projects, a lot of space-related stuff, and uh, writing a fourth book right now, and uh, I wrote an action scene. It's a historical fiction, so I wrote an action scene on the surface of the moon today, which was fun, and uh, so yeah, lot, lots of fun projects going on. And I talked with a friend who just moved to New Zealand a couple hours ago. We had a virtual housewarming down in Auckland, which uh, he's, it's tomorrow there, but it was, uh, it was really nice also. So yeah, lots of things going on. How are so, you? That is a good day, though. There is a good day when you go, what did you do today? I wrote an action scene on the moon. You know, there's a certain, <laughs> like I had one day when I was writing my book, and I thought, what did I do today? I talked about chimpanzee language with Jane Goodall. That's a good day. You know, there's certain phrases where yeah. you go, that was fun. Uh, well, we're doing yeah. really well. We're only, uh, Steve and I have now been on stage for nine and a half hours. Uh, we're doing fine. We have uh, another kind of 15 and a half, 16 and a half hours left. So we are, we're going through, you know, emotionally, it's, it's so many, it's a range. Um, but I know you're going to talk about something first of all. You've got to, got to, uh, you were going to, going to explain a few things to us, and then we'll do a quick Q and A. Is that okay? Sure. I, I thought I would talk uh, uh, sort of based on what Santa was just talking about. But I thought I would talk about maybe this is a good year to think about leaving Earth. And so, uh, <laughs> Trent, I don't know if it's you or if it's Rory is putting up the slides, but I have a bunch of slides to look at. So uh, if I don't know if I'll be, I assume I'll be able to see those, so I know where we're going. But um, let me know when we have those slides up for so people So you've got the see. first slide, you've got the kind of blue marble slide. Okay, there we go. I see it now. I see myself and I see that. All right, thank you very much. So yeah, I think it's a pretty good year to leave Earth. So, um, but let's, let's just talk about this for a minute, leaving Earth. So uh, next slide, please. So you're going to have to build yourself some sort of uh, Santa's sleigh, or in this case, some sort of spaceship if you want to leave Earth. This was the very first spaceship. That's Sputnik right there, which is the Russian word for little traveler. So you need some sort of ship, you know, that you can travel in. But the trouble is, if you want to leave Earth, you have to go fast. And the question would be, next slide, how fast do you have to go? Well, this uh, is, the, is the equation that governs it. And the G is the great big G of the universe, and M is the mass of the Earth, and R is the distance from the middle of the Earth. And if you just do that math, then, you, you know, depending how far away you are, you know how fast you have to go to stay in orbit. So let's fill in the numbers. Next slide, please, Roy. So if you just put in the big G and the big M there and, and the R for someone, you know, sort of just in a regular orbit, you put in all those numbers and you do the math. Next slide, please. This is how fast you have to get going in order to be in your little Sputnik or your Santa sleigh and orbit the Earth. Roughly eight kilometers a second. So how are you going to get going 
where, no matter what your vehicle, how are you going to get going eight kilometers a second? Next slide, please. So maybe you could build a fanciful rocket ship like this one in the 60s, long and skinny, and you get some important uh, people on the pad who get clear of the pad before the engine lights. And then there it goes, and then the first piece falls away, and now you're just a lighter, and then the front comes off, and there's your little Sputnik, and wham, you're in orbit, going eight kilometers a second. But that's not really how the Sputnik rocket looked. Next slide, please. This is what Sputnik in October of 1957, what the rocket launch actually looked like when the first vehicle wanted to leave Earth. And if for those of you paying attention, if you look really closely, next slide, please. This is what that rocket ship actually looked like. Rory, if you go to the next slide for me, please. It was not long and skinny, but it was kind of squatty and, and homely looking. This was the uh, Sputnik rocket. But the reason is, you got to get through the air. And those things, uh, next slide, please. Those things clustered around the bottom of that rocket. There they are right there. Those are actually just extra pushers to get you through the air. And you need, on this little rocket, you need four of them. And they're just burning, you know, kerosene, oxygen. But that thing right there, that's the design that got Sputnik into orbit on October. And everything we've ever flown in space since sort of looks like that. Next slide, please. Like this one here that, that I flew twice. It's sort of the same. It's got some sort of engines on the back to get you uh, orbital speed, but it's got those great big two white things to get you above the air, sort of like those strap-on boosters that were in the uh, in the Sputnik. Next slide, please. And they only burn for two minutes, and then they explode off. They're all done. They're out of fuel. They've done their job, and now they're going to just go somewhere else. Well, you accelerate away from space. In fact, they just fall into the ocean and, and largely are unusable. Maybe we can salvage some pieces. This is the view from the rocket, in case you happen to be uh, slim pickings riding the rocket there. Yeehaw. Um, and, and then in the distance, you can see as the two rockets fall away, there's the shuttle accelerating away. Next slide. And you go from those rockets, would get you to about six times the speed of sound, up to that orbital speed of just under eight kilometers a second, which is, you know, Mach 25. Um, and that's what this shuttle does here for the next six minutes. It takes you from Mach 6 and accelerates you faster and faster and faster until finally you get up to orbital speed. And that's how the shuttle did it. Next slide. But we've come a long way, baby, since then. And this is what we're working on right now, of course, with the best of the world's technology. And this also is the same. It's got that thing on the bottom, which is the super heavy. And it's... Uh, it, it has 8 million pounds of thrust, and it, it's huge. It's 9 meters across and 250 feet long. And that thing, next slide, please, that thing could actually come back and, and, and land. I mean, that's a, it doesn't just fall into the Atlantic or fall in, in you know, the plains of Kazakhstan. That first thing, that, that's super heavy, it's going to be able to push the rocket above the air and then come back and land to get used again, which, which is a great advantage. Next slide, please. Um, but the second piece, the one on the left, that's where the people go or the cargo goes, and it's reusable too. So it's a huge change from the early rockets where nothing was reusable until now, uh, everything is going to be reusable. But of course, all sorts of stuff's gonna go wrong in testing. And next slide, please. You know, you have to figure out how much pressure can we subject this to before, boom, it blows up. And, and uh, you build your test models as accurately and cheaply as possible. And in this case, not only did it blow up, but it blew the top off. And it was kind of fun to watch the top, I think, down there in Texas come tumbling down to Earth. Very high thrust, very uh, short duration flight. But you learn from that until eventually you figure out, next slide, please, that we can maybe start to fly this thing. And just a couple days ago, with only three of the of the eventual six engines, for the very first time, the Starship flew much like it's going to fly for real. And this was down in Boca Chica, right down on the Mexican border in Texas, as this uh, this brand new idea that's just 63 years since Sputnik went, is uh, it, with those three big um, uh, Raptor engines pushing on the bottom, is now our next step. Next slide, please. But... So now you figured out how to get away from the earth, but eventually we're gonna beat COVID and Christmas will come around again. And now you wanna come back to earth. Next slide, please. The trouble with coming back to earth is, if you remember, you're going, next please, eight kilometers a second. So how are you gonna get yourself slowed down uh, from eight kilometers a second? Next slide, please. So the way we do it, rather than bringing a whole bunch of fuel to turn those 7.54 times 10 to the three meters per second into nothing, we have to use friction. Next, please. And so we do. We just use the free deceleration of aerobraking. And this is like a drawing of the uh, 
of the SpaceX uh, Crew Dragon coming into the atmosphere. And then on my third space flight, next slide, please, I flew the, much as Samantha Cristoforetti did, I flew this little ship, the uh, Soyuz, and this is the view out the window of the Soyuz as you're coming through the atmosphere. And those are actual pieces of your spaceship burning off, which is disconcerting, but, um, but it worked. Next slide, please. And then eventually, uh, parachute opens, you can get close enough to the ground to be able to land. But how did the very first astronaut, the, the cosmonaut, Yuri Gagarin land, his ship was called Vostok, which means east. And they did the same thing. His rocket got him up there, went around the world, he used friction to slow down. But if you see, if you look closely, what is Yuri sitting in? He's sitting on an ejection seat. And actually the way that the Soviets at the time won the space race to put the first human being into space was when Yuri got down to about I don't know, five or six kilometers. He ejected out of Vostok. Next slide, please. And uh, and came floating down on a parachute. And that, uh, next slide, please, if you could, um, Rory. And that's how uh, Gagarin won the race. In fact, the ship just buried itself in the field. So maybe that's okay for one try, but that's not a sustainable plan. So we built better vehicles ever since. Next slide, please. And we thought in the 60s, maybe we should uh, land the Apollo missions in the water because water is softer. But sometimes only two of your three parachutes open, like an Apollo 15, and water is still hard when you belly flop into it. And, and also what trouble with landing in the water is, you know, you can sink and you can drown. So that's not the perfect answer either. And um, ever since the beginning, next slide, please, the uh, the Soviet system has to been to land on land. But uh, if you think water is hard, watch this, try landing on land. And this is what I did on my third space flight. Wham, I mean, you hit hard. And this is what it looks like inside the cockpit as you hit the ground. That's actually Samantha sitting there. I mean, you get rattled and shaken. Next slide, please. And your vehicle tumbles end over end. And, and, and obviously your ship is not particularly reusable. So we've been getting better and better. But then we thought in the, in the 70s, next slide, please, maybe we could build a more reusable spaceship. And so we built the space shuttle, which, which as I say, I had a chance to fly twice. And it's pretty amazing. I mean, it could come back and land like an airplane. But the trouble with that is, you have wings and a tail through your whole flight, which were dead weight until the end. In fact, they're a liability. And no matter what happens, you still have to have, you know, uh, all those good wheels and tires have to have held pressure for all that time. And you need a good runway and you need nice weather and you need one of the best test pilots in the world. Those are the only people we ever let fly that thing because it was such a beast. So even though it was an amazing spaceship, even that is not the right answer. Next slide, please. And I think now, taking advantage of all this technology, we are finally at the stage where you could leave Earth and return to Earth in maybe a, a cheaper and safer and more predictable fashion. Next slide, please. And this is what happened just three or four days ago. There's that starship as it's coming back down through the atmosphere, that phase where it's being held up by the air. And this is just the latter part of it, but they had to prove, you know, does it fly or not? And this weird looking thing, flew completely under control down into the atmosphere. And then amazingly enough, uh, next slide please, they found a way to tip the nose up and you'll watch it torque itself up and then try and get those three big Raptor engines going again. And they had some trouble with their fuel flow. See, there's only two of them burning there. And then they started chewing themselves up and one of them quit and then the other one quit. And so it hit the ground too hard and the last little bit of fuel blew up. Uh, but they got almost everything done in that test flight. Nobody was hurt. Next slide please. And very shortly, we will be launching human beings on a vehicle like that and coming back and landing right next to where we launched in a place like that from the uh, from the Gulf Coast of Texas, which is pretty amazing. And I'm just about done. Next slide, please. And maybe we can use that same ship not only to take off and land and get up to eight kilometers a second, but you just have to go 40% faster, the square root of two, 1.414. If you can just get going 40% faster, so eight, you know, that's about, what, 12 kilometers a second, you can go to the moon. And that vehicle's capable of doing that. And if it can land on the Earth, it can land on the moon as well. And maybe that's where we're gonna be spending Christmas in a few years with Earth in the distance. Next slide, please. And maybe a good place where they wouldn't have COVID. So that's what you need to do to leave the Earth. And to finish, last slide, if you would please, Rory. I think progress is wonderful and I'm all for it. Robin, back to you. Thanks, Chris. The, uh... 
Very little debate in this room about progress being wonderful, by the way. I think this is the audience for that. The, um, I, have to, I don't know if you can remember this. A few months ago, we were talking, and we were talking about the size of the, that once something has numbers, it's almost like we can comprehend it, and actually it's huge. And I think we were talking about the, the, the size of our galaxy is 100,000 light years, and we were talking about... You, you told me you'd done the maths on the Starship Enterprise going at warp speed nine, which I think is nine times the speed of light cubed. The, yes. the time that would still take to go across our galaxy. Yeah, I mean, it, it still takes uh, more year. You know, if you just do it, it our galaxy is, is uh, it's more than 100, we think, actually. It's in the order of hundreds of light years across. And sure, you're going, you know, the speed of light and, and such. But, but if you just do the simple math, you realize that just across our galaxy at warp nine, it's still going to take decades, you know, even centuries. And, space, you know, the Enterprise was only up there on a five-year mission. They didn't go anywhere. They just drove around the neighborhood. They just visited the nearby places. The numbers are staggeringly huge. You know, it's it's incomprehensible to think just how far away things are by by our own measure. And even though the the rockets and things that I showed, you know, they burn kerosene or hydrogen or methane and oxygen, uh, chemical engines are never going to get us beyond our solar system. They may not even get us to Mars. We we have to invent some other way of traveling. And there's lots of people in the audience that know just how recently we really started to understand even electricity. I don't think the, the electron was discovered until like 120 years ago. And yet think a revolutionary electricity has been for society and for culture. Imagine if we could figure out the particle, much like an electron, that is related to gravity. So that then just as we've learned to harness electricity, that we could also find some way to harness gravity. And it sounds fanciful, but, but so would electricity not too long ago. And maybe that's where the answer is. If we can somehow figure out what, what causes gravity and not just put a great big G for it and say, well, that's the you know, gravitational constant, but actually understand the, uh, the subatomic physics, then maybe we can get to those speeds and live more of a Star Trek existence. We'll see. See, I'd love to now say that we were talking to a physicist earlier and he said the theory of everything is just around the corner, but the expression <laughs> on his face did not suggest that at all. I mean, that is yeah. the numbers. Again, like we were saying, you know, 100,000 light years. The moment you hear one light year, it sounds like it's close, doesn't it? And then you... Ah, yeah. uh, oh, man. We've got some great questions. We've got Caleb, uh, seven-year-old Caleb. Uh, he wants to tell Chris that uh, you're a hero. He wants that imparted to you, first of all. Uh, okay. And he wants to know uh, what your first thought was uh, when you saw Earth from orbit. You know, the cool thing, Caleb, is uh, on my first two space flights, I launched out of Florida, but we were going to go dock with the space station, which was tipped up from the equator. So we launched sort of towards the north and the spaceship went up the coast of the United States, past the coast of Canada. The engine shut off. We floated across the Atlantic in about 10 or 12 minutes. And the first place I saw was Ireland and the UK. First place I could see out the window. And so, you know, what do you think when you've unstrapped out of your chair and you pull yourself weightless for the first time and you can see uh, from overhead of Dublin or London, you can see Rome and you can see Stockholm. You know, you can see all of that geology and geography and human history. And what I found myself thinking, Caleb, was, am I big or am I little? Because in proportion to the thousands of kilometers I'm seeing, I'm this little puny nothing. But I was also a kid like you who dreamed of doing it and had turned myself into someone who could be an astronaut like that. And so that was huge. And so I sort of, when I was floating by the window, I felt this great sense of wonder and awe. And I felt like a little tiny ant, you know, looking at, at a giant forest. Number one, feeling small, but at the same time, seeing just how important it is to be able to understand it and put ourselves right out on the edge of what we experience. So it's a wonderful feeling. I, I hope you get to experience it. I, I remember I, I was talking to Nicole Stott a couple of uh, months ago and she was saying that, you know, there is that joy of seeing the, 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 the earth without borders. But she said there was still, and I don't know if you had that, she said still when she could see Florida, she would get a little flutter of, and that's where I live, that's home. Yeah. Have you ever thought, Robin, what is home for you? Do you have do you have a 
Do you have a sense, a, a concrete sense of home for you? I think so, yeah, in some ways. I have a strange well, where, thing. Where is that? Well, it is in, in the small village that I was brought up in because I, when I go and stay with my dad, I sleep in the room I was born in. And I think that immediately, it's a weird thing, you know, to have that link. For me, home, I thought about it because I've lived in, I've been, I don't know, 100 countries and lived off the planet and a bunch of other places for a lot of years. Home is, is where I feel like I'm exhaling more than I'm inhaling. Like, I just feel sort of a sense of peace. And, and you know, a lot of places around the world feel that way for me because I've had wonderful experiences in different places. Some places it just feels like like a natural base to me. And, and, and I, but the place that I am sitting right now uh, is much like, I guess, your place here, Robin, where the bedroom that you were born in, and that is, this is Albert, by the way, He's turning 14 next week. Um, uh, where I'm sitting right now is a building made in 1896. It's on a, a cottage on a little island on the Canadian-American border. And uh, I've been coming here since I was one or two years old. And I've been lucky enough to be here throughout the whole pandemic. And to me, there's, there's the whole world feels like home, but there's no place truly makes me feel as at peace as where I am right now. And it's great to see Albert as well, because that one of the lovely things about doing Infinite Monkey Cage now is that we just do it connecting up to people like this. So everyone's in their home. So it's the first time that I think we had, we had four astronauts on and also a guest appearance where Albert just started barking a little bit during the show. And we've never had that when we do the BBC Radio Theatre. No one ever brings their dogs. It was a delightful thing. I, I would like to point out, though, that uh, barking can be transmitted virtually, but Albert emits some other gases that you're lucky that cannot be uh, transmitted virtually, <laughs> at least with our technology so far. Maybe that's the propellant that's required. We'll find out. Um, this is uh, another one going... Uh, it's recently been announced, the 2025 Space Hotel plans. Uh, is that a pipe dream, or is that an actual possibility? Well, uh, I don't know where 2025 comes from. I mean, who's going to build the hotel and how, how are you going to get there? And, you know, how do you change the linen and where does the sewage go and how do you get food and how's there going to be help? And it's, you know, eventually, of course, I mean, I've lived in space for six months in a sort of a more like a dormitory than, than a hotel, but eventually, but it's sort of like, uh, are there hotels in, in Antarctica? You know, there's, lot, there's thousands of people live there in McMurdo and all the other stations, but it's not exactly hotel country. Uh, and, and space is a lot more complex than that, or even right at the South Pole. We're sort of technologically limited. So no, I wouldn't count on hotels in space by 2025. But I think uh, if you just look from that presentation, if you look at, you know, Sputnik and then Vostok with Yuri Gagarin, I was born before Yuri Gagarin flew in space. All of that stuff has happened just in, in my lifetime so far. So you don't have to be a G rocket scientist to, to look backwards at that change and then look forwards and see that the pace of invention is accelerating and gonna open up a lot of new doors. So eventually you'll be able to buy a ticket, go to space or go to the moon and, and, and pay to be there, which essentially is like a hotel, I guess. But we still have a lot of things to invent and perfect and stop blowing up you know, and get it right. But uh, but we're more on that track now than at any time in history. And we've got another, uh, Ben would like to know, uh, he said, this might be a silly question, but as we know, there are no silly questions. If they come from a good place, their curiosity is good. So, but uh, were you properly scared on the launch pad or was the adrenaline and excitement too much? Uh, before I was an astronaut, I was a test pilot. And before that, I was a fighter pilot. And when I was in my early 20s, I was a downhill ski racer. I'll, not, you know, not Olympic caliber, but, you know, okay. All of those things have danger involved in them. But if you talk to uh, a test pilot or an astronaut, the last thing they want in their veins is adrenaline. Because adrenaline is your body's last ditch effort to squirt a nasty chemical into you so that just for a few seconds you can be ridiculously strong or fast to deal with something that otherwise you would have no capability to deal with. And it, it doesn't do you any good. I mean, the, 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 the low that comes after adrenaline is not, not a healthy thing for your body. That is not a good way to fly a spaceship. You know, instead, 
just like a downhill ski racer, you don't take someone off the street and put them on the top of the mountain and put them in a skin suit and you know send them down the hill. They train f since they're a little kid, and that's what I did for spaceships as well. I trained every day. I learned to, you know, how I learned to scuba dive and I learned how airplanes worked. And then I got my glider license and my powered license and joined the Air Force and flew dozens of different airplanes and faster airplanes and then tested airplanes. After all that, and then I trained for years as an astronaut and then. I get into the rocket ship so that the danger was still there. It was it was just as risky as it was going to be. But my fear had been taken away because I knew what I was doing. So it, it's there's a difference between danger and fear. They're not we sometimes say, oh, that must be scary. Things aren't scary. Just sometimes people are scared. And the whole question is, are you ready for this? And as a result, for all three of my rocket launches, I knew I was taking a risk, but it was a risk I was choosing to take and that I had done everything within my power to get ready for. And therefore, it wasn't scary. It was exciting and exhilarating. And I knew I might die, but I, I know I'm going to die anyway. We're all going to die. The real question is, what do you do while you're alive? And have you used your time to get ready for it? And if you have, then I think uh, life can be magnificent. And uh, and flying a rocket ship, it it you know, it's a risk worth taking. It it takes you to a place that otherwise you could never be. It is such a. I've just been watching a lot of footage of different people on the ISS, and you just look out the window they can see, and I think, oh, if only I had uh, the temperament and the physical health and the psychology and everything else that's required. And I don't have any of them. I'm the wrong guy. Yet again, another job I'm the wrong guy for. Um, final question, Audrey would like to know: uh, Would you like to go back in space, for instance, if there was a moon base? Audrey, I'd love to fly in space again. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily just want to go for like a joyride. You know, just, you know, I, I, I try and do things in life with purpose, you know, I, and it's definitely going to be taking a risk to fly a rocket ship. And so I gotta have to ask myself, what's the risk for? But so much pleasure that I got out of being an astronaut was helping to make space flight possible, you know, to help invent better spaceships, to help the space shuttle uh, get designed the whole, yeah, you know, I helped design the displays and the space shuttle itself. And, and I help change procedures for flying the Russian Soyuz. And there's a wonderful pleasure in challenging yourself to do something that is right on the edge of impossible and through your own skill and cunning and contribution to be able to make it better and safer. And then to go do that thing, it's extremely rewarding and gratifying to just jump in and sit, you know, like a ride at the fair, it'd be okay. But but I've been so lucky and so rich. But you're right, Audrey, to have a chance to fly to the moon has always been my dream since I was a little boy. Uh, that's kind of what originally inspired me. I would still love to walk on the moon. And it's what I'm writing this fourth book about, in fact. And so, yes, uh, if, if you are offering, Audrey, let's go. I'd love to. But remember, he wants to have a fight on the moon. We find out, found out about that early on. He's given himself away. The, um, I'll just quickly say before, uh, Chris is, is going to sing a song for us as, as, as well. And uh, just mention uh, for everyone watching, uh, some of the other people we've got coming up, if you'd like to send in questions for, uh, questions for Eric Idle. We've got Eric later on uh, tonight or almost early in the morning. Uh, if you've got questions for Eric, uh, please send them. Again, hashtag uh, 9 lessons 24 uh, Dr. Carl's going to be joining us. And Dr. Carl, got, you know, just ask, find if you can find anything that Dr. Carl can't have an answer for, uh, and also questions for David Eagleman, the brilliant neuroscientist and wonderful author of some, amongst other things, and questions for Robin Hitchcock, obviously, about our Giant Killer Crabs musical. Um, but, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, he's on your screen now with, uh, I, th I, I, know, I think I know the song you can do, and it's a fantastic song. Uh, you're in for a real treat. Ladies and gentlemen, on your screen, it's Commander Chris Hatfield. Uh, I grew up celebrating Christmas in my family, and this is a, a space Christmas carol. Imagine, you know, we have the tradition of the of the star, you know, in Bethlehem. And this year, of course, we have two of the largest planets coming together to give us sort of a Christmas star. Um, but the space station is a star of its own, like a jewel in the night. And this song is a Christmas carol called Jewel in the Night that my brother Dave and I wrote. Here we go. I don't know if uh, Steve Pretty and Band after nine hours are going to try and join in or not. We'll see how it goes. But I'll just play away as if, uh, as if. So bright, jewel in the night, there in my window below. So bright, 
yet dark as the night with all of our cities aglow. It's long been our way to honor this day and offer goodwill to men. And no, wherever we go, it's come round to Christmas again. I'm gonna go to the bridge, Steve, if you're playing. Here we go. Love for the families that gather below. Love for the stranger that you'll never know. For those who aren't with you. Who wander above. So bright, jewel in the night. There lies the cradle we knew. Home of all that we love and all of our memories too. And it shall be our way to wander away and take with us all that we know and never cease this message of peace from Bethlehem so long ago. And never cease this message of peace from Bethlehem so long ago. Thanks, Robin, to, for raising all the funds for Nine Lessons and for the Doctors Without Borders. Great to see you. I hope to see you very soon in the new year. And we could all use a new year. Thank you so much for joining us, Chris. Hopefully, Generator 2021, if I don't see you before then, back in Toronto. Uh, thank you very much, Chris Hadfield. And we have, uh, I should say, he mentioned Samantha Cristoforetti a few times there. Samantha's joining us later on, uh, as is Helen Sharman as well. Uh, and as I mentioned before as well, if you've got questions for the neuroscientist David Eagleman, for Dr. Carl, for Eric Idle, uh, then send them in. Don't forget the, the charities. We're, I'm hoping, normally when we do the Hammersmith show and we do these shows, we end up making around 60 to 70,000 pounds for uh, the different charities that we give to. I would really hope we can get to maybe half of that. Uh, that would be fantastic. If we are able in the 24 hours to make 35,000 that we can give to turn to uh, us and to uh, Mind and to Médecins Sans Frontier and uh, also to uh, the charity. And oh man, uh, uh, I've got to do this. You don't know about this. I, I, have I picked up the right one? Right, this is the most stupid thing, right? Uh, because uh, Ginny Smith, uh, who writes very good books about psychology and knows what she's talking about, she decided the best thing to do to test uh, my uh, mental decline uh, during the 25 hours that we're on stage was to play a game called Bop It, which I've never played before, and so far I haven't really managed to even turn on. So um, we're going to see if I can turn it on this time. I don't know if I've got the right one. Let's see. Right, okay, are you ready? See if I can get past three. Yeah, if you do that, I can't hear the instructions, okay? We are gonna fall out during tonight if you're not careful. This is very shameful, right? I would like to remind everyone that I have previously won point to celebrities, so this is not, you know, just, just so you remember. And, oh yeah, Brian Cox thinks he's got a CBE and that's it. He has not got a piece of Perspex mass produced for point to celebrities. So, um, right, here we go. Right, none of this dicking around. No. I don't know what that one is. <laughs> right. Oh, I think I got past it. I think I did the right thing. Anyway, never mind. That went great. So it's not going to be so much judging my um, skill of bop it. It's going to be how much I swear at it where we see our decline. So I'm never going to get beyond four, but the level of swearing will show that because as Stephen Pinker wrote, the swearing is kept in a different part of the brain, apparently. There we go. That's how scientific. And that bit, swearing is kept in a separate box in the brain. Anyway, so uh, we're now going to introduce, uh, I think... the. Oh, hang on. Uh, Trent is now going to give me an enormous number of detailed instructions over the... Uh, go on then, tell me what you want me to say. 
Steve, right, you are, if you start playing, and then the Before Christmas Carol, and then uh, we're going to start the video, I will explain, and then I'll give you a clue, and then a cue, and then about 20 seconds in, uh, and as a special treat, you and I are both allowed to have another uh, mug of pasta shapes. Uh, that's how we're living. Of the, we, to be like, that's literally all we've got backstage is a big box of celebrations that we're dealing with carefully and uh, pasta shapes that are placed in a mug and taste almost like pasta. Yeah! So, uh, now, uh, what, Christmas Carol, we've got an enormous number of people. As I mentioned before, I've got such a huge list. I don't know if I'm going to go... If, if the fun game to play is, you know, will you recognise every single one of these people because they're so great. You will definitely know uh, Joe Brown, and Andy Nyman, Guy Pearce, uh, and they are, they're so great. It's such a great list of people, and some of my favourite people are in this. So this is uh, our uh, multiple reading. But if any of you are old enough to remember uh, the Christmas celebrity record breakers that used to be presented by Roy Castle, this is what this is like, right? This is better than any panto you're going to see. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, now, uh, for the next 40, 45 minutes, here is the special nine lessons and carols for a socially distanced people a Christmas carol and now Steve play your music I should say by way of introduction that my band recorded these bits remotely and I shall be mixing it live because I haven't seen this all the way through yet so here we go as dead as a doornail. This must be distinctly understood or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm going to relate. Mind, I don't mean to say that I know of my own knowledge what there is particularly dead about a doornail. I might have been inclined myself to regard a coffin nail as the deadest piece of ironmongery in the trade. But the wisdom of our ancestors is in the simile, and my unhallowed hands shall not disturb it or the country's done for. You will therefore permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was as dead as a doornail. Marley and Scrooge were business partners once, but then Marley died, and now their film belonged to Scrooge. Alone, a stingy and heartless old man, Scrooge had his cell phone go off in the bush. He was very frightened. That's okay. It's just a low battery. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. He was secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather. And in Scrooge's office, it was not much warmer either. Suddenly, a cheerful person entered the office. Why, it was Scrooge's nephew. A Merry Christmas, Uncle, Fred said. Ah, said Scrooge, humbug. Christmas, a humbug, Uncle, said Scrooge's nephew. You don't mean that, I am sure. I do, said Scrooge. What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come then, 
returned his nephew. What right have you to be dismal? You're rich enough. If I could work my will, said Scrooge indignantly, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Uncle, pleaded the nephew. Nephew, returned the uncle sternly. Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Scrooge's nephew left. A Christmas lunch invite declined as two gentlemen came in to collect money for the poor. Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? He asked sarcastically. Oh, many would rather die, they said then they had better do it quickly and decrease the surplus population. I don't make merry myself at Christmas and I can't afford to make idle people merry. Scrooge turned to his employee, the clerk, Bob Cratchit. And you'll be wanting all day off tomorrow, I suppose, said Scrooge. Uh, that is customary, answered the clerk. Humbug, said Scrooge. I have to pay you for the day, although you don't work. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But if it must be, I want you to start work even earlier the following morning. Cratchit promised that he would. And Scrooge walked out with a growl. Scrooge lived all alone in an old house that had once belonged to his deceased business partner Marley. When Scrooge went to unlock the door, he had the feeling that he saw Marley's face in the knocker. He was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up upon its ghostly forehead. To say that he was not startled would be untrue, but Scrooge was not frightened easily. Humbug, he said. He opened the door and walked in. He locked himself in, however, which he usually didn't do, but then he felt safe again and sat down before the fire. Suddenly, Scrooge heard a clanking noise deep down below as if somebody was dragging a heavy chain through the cellar. The noise came nearer and nearer, and then Scrooge saw a ghost coming right through the heavy door. Marley's ghost, the same face, the very same, and its chains were long. They were made of cash boxes, keys, and heavy purses. Who are you? asked Scrooge. In life, I was your partner. Jacob Marley, do you believe in me? Asked the ghostly Marley. I don't, said Scrooge. Why do you doubt your senses? Because, said Scrooge, a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of underdone potato. There's more of gravy than grave about you, whatever you are. Marley's ghost said, I must wander through the world unhappily because I was so awful in life. I wear these chains because I made them myself, link by link, when I never walked beyond our counting house. I only cared about business, but not about the people around me. You were always a good man of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply this to himself. Business, <laughs> cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. Charity, mercy, kindness, and friendship were all my business. Yet I ignored them all to count money and deal with other business. Marley held up his chain at arm's length as if that were the cause of all of his grief and flung it heavily upon the ground again. Look, I am here tonight to warn you, Marley said, that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. You will be haunted, resumed the ghost, by three spirits. Well, I, uh, I think I'd rather not, said Scrooge. Without their visit, said the ghost, you cannot hope to escape the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. So couldn't I just um, take them all at once and have it over, Jacob, maybe? Hinted Scrooge. 
when the bell tolls one, the ghost shrieked. When he had said these words, Marley's ghost disappeared through the window. When Scrooge looked out curiously, he saw the air was filled with restless phantoms moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. The misery of them all was clear. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. Double locked by his own hands, the bolts undisturbed. Scrooge returned to bed, and when he awoke in the dark of night, the thought of Marley's ghost bothered him exceedingly. He didn't know whether it was a dream or not. Scrooge resolved to lie awake. And then... Ding! Dong! A deep, dull, hollow, melancholy one. The hour itself, said Scrooge triumphantly, and nothing else. And yet, light flashed up in the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn aside, I tell you, by a hand. Then Scrooge found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor. It was a strange figure, like a child. Yet its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white, as if with age. "'Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me?' asked Scrooge. "'I am.' The voice was soft and gentle, singularly low, as if, instead of being so close beside him, it were at a distance. "'Who and what are you?' Scrooge demanded. "'I am the ghost of Christmas past.' Rise and come with me. Scrooge could not plead that the weather was cold and that he was wearing only his slippers, dressing gown and nightcap. The ghost took Scrooge back in time to a familiar place. Good heavens, said Scrooge, clasping his hands together as he looked about him. I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years, observed the ghost. Let us go on. They walked along the road, Scrooge recognising every gate and post and tree. Scrooge watched many in great spirits and merriment on this particular Christmas Eve. These are but shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost. They have no consciousness of us. Why was he rejoiced beyond all bounds to see them? Why did his cold eye glisten and his heart leap up as they went past? What was Merry Christmas to Scrooge? out upon Merry Christmas. What good had it ever done to him? The school is not quite deserted, said the ghost. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. Oh, I know it, said Scrooge. They went, the ghost and Scrooge, inside the house across the way, and to a door at the back of the house. It opened before them and disclosed a long, bare, sad room made barer still by lines of desks. And at one of these, a lonely boy was reading near a feeble fire. And Scrooge wept to see his poor forgotten self as he used to be. What is the matter? asked the spirit. Nothing, said Scrooge, nothing. His voice trailing off in a flood of memories of yesterdays and yesteryears alike. The ghost smiled. Let us see another Christmas. Although they had but that moment left the school behind them, they were now in the busy thoroughfares of a city where shadowy passengers passed and repassed, where shadowy carts and coaches battled for the way, and all the strife and tumult of real city were. But quite how all this was brought about, Scrooge knew no more than you do. He only knew that everything had happened so, and that here it was, Christmas too. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it, said Scrooge. I apprenticed here. At sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig, sitting behind such a high desk that if he had been two inches taller, he must have knocked his head against the ceiling. Scrooge cried in great excitement. Why, it's old Fezziwig! Bless his heart. 
It's Fezziwig, alive again. Well, this must be one of the Merry Christmas Eves we spent with his family and friends. <laughs> the doors opened and in came all the guests, one after another. In they all came, anyhow and everyhow. Away they all went, twenty couples dancing at once. During the whole of this time, Scrooge had acted like a man out of his wits. His heart and soul were in the scene and with his former self. He corroborated everything, remembered everything, enjoyed everything, and underwent the strangest agitation as he recalled the ghost's proclamations. I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all, said Scrooge. My time grows short, observed the spirit. Quick. This was not addressed to Scrooge or to anyone whom he could see, but it produced an immediate effect. For again, Scrooge saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of life. His face had not the harsh and rigid lines of later years, but it had begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. There was an eager, greedy, restless motion in the eye, which showed the passion that had taken root and where the shadow of the growing tree would fall. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in whose eyes there were tears which sparkled in the light that shone out of the ghost of Christmas past. It matters little, she said softly. To you very little. Another love has displaced me. What love has displaced you? he asked. A golden one. You fear the world and love money too much, she answered gently. I have seen all your nobler dreams fall off one by one until the only passions left, gain and greed, engross you. Is it not true? What does it matter? Scrooge retorted. Even if I've grown so much wiser, what then? I still love you. She shook her head. We met when we were both poor, and now you're rich and I'm not good enough. I release you. I hope you'll be happy with the life you've chosen. Spirit, said Scrooge, show me no more. Take me home. Why do you torture me? I cannot bear it any longer. He struggled with the ghost to take him back, and finally Scrooge found himself in his own bed again. He was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness. Scrooge woke up in the middle of a snore just before the clock struck one again. A ghostly light led him to the next room, and with his hand upon the lock, he heard a strange voice call him by name and bid him enter. It was his own room. There was no doubt about that, but it had undergone a surprising transformation. It was decorated with sprigs of holly, mistletoe and ivy, and a roasting fire that blazed brightly up the chimney. Heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne was the makings of a feast, and in an easy state upon this couch there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, with a sparkling eye, an open hand and a joyful air. Come in! Come in! And know me better, man! I am the ghost of Christmas present. You have never seen the like of me before, exclaimed the spirit. Never, Scrooge made answer to it. Have you never walked forth with the younger members of my family? pursued the phantom. I'm afraid I have not, Scrooge said. Have you had many brothers, spirit? More than 1,800, said the ghost. Tremendous family to provide for, muttered Scrooge. And then he said, submissively, Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night through force and I learnt a lesson which is working now. So tonight, if you have anything to teach me, let me profit by it. The room vanished instantly and they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning where people were shoveling the snow from in front of their houses. The people were jovial and full of glee. They were calling out to one another and now and then exchanging a flying snowball. The ghost took Scrooge to Bob Cratchit's house, a very poor little dwelling. In the kitchen, Mrs. Cratchit was preparing Christmas dinner with potatoes bubbling merrily on the stove. Her children were cheerfully running around. 
Soon the door opened and Bob Cratchit came in with Tiny Tim upon his shoulders. Tiny Tim was Bob Cratchit's youngest son. He bore a little crutch and had an iron frame around his limbs. As the children ran off to play and to sneak a look at the boiling Christmas pudding, Mrs. Cratchit came close to her husband. And how did little Tim behave? As good as gold, said Bob, and better. Bob's voice trembled as he said that Tim was growing strong and hearty. His distant coughs first and then his crutches could be heard upon the stone floor and he was led by his siblings to sit at the table before another word was spoken. Bob turned up his cuffs as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby and began to help with the preparations. As the Cratchits were very poor, it was not much they had for Christmas dinner. But still, everyone was joyful, and you could feel that they all had the Christmas spirit in their hearts. Spirit, said Scrooge, who felt sorry for the boy. Tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see an empty seat, replied the ghost and a crutch without an owner. If these shadows don't change in the future, the child will die. No, no, said Scrooge. Oh no, kind spirit, say he will be spared. What do you care? If he is going to die, he had better do it quickly and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by the spirit and was overcome with regret and grief. Bob lifted his glass of punch. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us, said Bob Cratchit. God bless us, everyone, <coughs> said Tiny Tim. He sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool. Bob held his little hand, two littles there, could have used a different word, Dickens, as if he feared to lose him. And to the founder of the feast, said Bob, to Mr. Scrooge. Founder of the feast? Ha! said Mrs. Cratchit. If Scrooge were here, I'd give him a piece of my mind and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which was not dispelled for full five minutes. The spirit began to lead him away from the house. Scrooge had his eye upon the family and especially Tiny Tim to the last. The spirit took Scrooge to his nephew's house. It is a truth well known that while there is infection in disease and sorrow, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter good humour and coronavirus. We're not doing Zooms because of the jokes. When Scrooge's nephew laughed, his wife laughed as heartily as he, and their assembled friends too roared loudly. He said that Christmas was a humbug. As I live, cried Scrooge's nephew. He believed it too. More shame for him, Fred, said his wife indignantly. His wealth is of no use to him because he does no good with it. He loses some pleasant moments by not making merry with us and loses pleasant companions. I mean to give him the same chance every year whether he likes it or not, said Fred, for I pity him. He may rail at Christmas every year, but if he finds me always in a good mood, then perhaps he may be reached. <laughs> Soon the spirit led Scrooge away and they were on their travels again. Much they saw and far they went. Scrooge did not change outwardly, but the ghost did. He grew older, clearly older with every passing minute. Scrooge noticed the ghost's hair had turned grey. Are spirits lives so short? asked Scrooge. My life upon this globe is very brief, replied the ghost. It ends tonight. Woo! Suddenly, Scrooge noticed something else strange about the ghost. Two childlike figures were at the ghost's feet, a boy and a girl. 
but they looked old and dreadful, like little monsters. Where graceful youth should have filled their features out and touched them with its freshest tints, a stale and shriveled hand, like that of age, had pinched and twisted them and pulled them into shreds. Scrooge was shocked. Spirit, are they your creatures? Scrooge asked. They are man's creatures, said the spirit. The boy is ignorance, the girl is want. Beware them both, but most of all, beware this boy, for I see doom written upon him. Have they no place they can go? asked Scrooge. Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? The spirit jibed. The ghost of Christmas present disappeared. On the last stroke of the bell, Scrooge saw the third ghost, draped and hooded, coming towards him like a mist along the ground. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. It was shrouded in a deep black garment which hid its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. It thrilled him with a vague and certain horror to know that beneath the dusky shroud there were ghostly eyes intently fixed upon him. But Scrooge saw nothing but one great heap of black. Are you the ghost of the Christmas yet to come? asked Scrooge. I fear you more than any other spirit. The ghost not say a word. I know that your purpose is to do me good, said Scrooge. Lead on. They wandered into the heart of the city amongst the merchants, and the spirit stopped behind one little knot of businessmen. No, said a large man with a monstrous chin. I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When did he die? inquired another. Last night, I believe. I thought he'd never die. What has he done with his money? asked the red-faced gentleman with a pendulous excrescence on the end of his nose that shook like the gills of a turkey. That's what I want to know. The pleasantry was received with a great laugh and the speakers and listeners strolled away and mixed with other groups. Scrooge knew the men and looked to the spirit for an explanation. None was forthcoming. So Scrooge resolved to treasure up every word he heard and everything he saw and resolved to observe the shadow of himself when it appeared, feeling an inkling that the conduct of his future self might give him the clue he was missing. Spirit, said Scrooge, shuddering from head to foot, I see, I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. If there is any person in this town who feels any emotion caused by my death, show that person to me, spirit, I beseech you. The ghost led them away from the busy scene and into an obscure part of town where Scrooge had never been before. Down one of the narrow alleyways was a shop owned by an elderly crook who was inviting in some of his fellow thieves into his den. As they talked, it became apparent to Scrooge that they brought in stolen objects with them and were making fun of the person who'd once owned these things. <laughs> Laughed one of the women. Why was any kinder in his lifetime? If he had been, he might have had somebody to look after him when he was dying. Instead of lying, gasping out his breath, all alone. As each of the thieves presented their goods to the shopkeeper to sell, they continued making their tools. He frightened everybody away from him when he was alive to profit us now that he's dead. <laughs> The phantom spread its dark robe before him for just a moment, and the scene changed. They entered poor Bob Cratchit's house and found the mother and the children by the fire. Quiet, very quiet, 
the noisy little Cratchits were still as statues. When Bob Cratchit came in, the children hurried to greet him as if to say, Don't mind it, Father. Don't be sad. You went there today, said his wife. Yes, my dear, returned Bob. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green the place is. But you'll see it often. I promised our poor child that we would visit every Sunday. He broke down in tears. He couldn't help it. The ghost moved on again taking Scrooge through the iron gate of the churchyard. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Scrooge slowly went towards it, trembling and following the ghost's finger. Read upon the stone of the grave, his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. Spirit, Scrooge cried, are these the shadows of the things that will be? Or can this future be changed? Hear me, I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been so far. Why show me this if I am past all hope? Good spirit, I will honor the intended spirit of Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present and the future. The spirits of all three shall be within me. I will not ignore the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me that I may change my fate. Full of fear, Scrooge caught the spirit's hand, but the spirit suddenly changed. It shrunk and faded and finally turned into a bedpost. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. Best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own and he could make the best of it. I will live in the past, present, and the future, Scrooge repeated as he got out of bed. I don't know what to do. I'm as happy as an angel. He ran to the window, opened it, and put out his head. What's today, cried Scrooge, calling downward to a boy in Sunday clothes. Eh? returned the boy, confused. What's today, my fine fellow? Today, replied the boy. Why, Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day, said Scrooge to himself. I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. They can do anything they like. Of course they can. Hello, my fine fellow. Do you know the poulterers at the corner? I sure do. Excellent boy. And do you know whether they've sold the big turkey that was hanging up there? What? The one as big as me, returned the boy. It's still hanging there now. Is it, said Scrooge. Go and buy it. I am in earnest. Go and buy it and come back with the man and I may give them the direction where to take it. I'll give you a shilling for it. Come back with the man in less than five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit, whispered Scrooge cheerfully. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. He dressed himself all in his best and at last got out into the streets. He had not gone far when he came across the two gentlemen who had walked into his office the day before. My dear sir, said Scrooge, how do you do? I fear I wasn't very pleasant to you yesterday. Allow me to ask your pardon, and will you have the goodness to... Hear, Scrooge whispered in his ear. Lord bless me, cried the gentleman. My dear Scrooge, are you serious? I don't know what to say to such generosity. If you please, said Scrooge, not a farthing less. A great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. Scrooge walked about the streets, watched the people hurrying to and fro, and found that everything could yield him pleasure. He had never dreamed that any walk, that anything, could give him so much happiness. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. Fred, he implored, it's your Uncle Scrooge. I've come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Of course Fred let him in. It was a very (coughs) hearty welcome and they all had a wonderful party. But Scrooge was early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. 
if he could only catch Bob Cratchit coming late. And he did it. Yes, he did. Bob was a full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come in. Hello, growled Scrooge in his usual way. What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I am very sorry, sir, said Bob. I am behind time. It's only once a year, sir, and it shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now I'll tell you what, my friend, said Scrooge. I am not going to stand this sort of thing any longer, and therefore, he continued, leaping from his stool and giving Bob such a dig in the waistcoat that he staggered back. And therefore, I am about to raise your salary. Bob trembled. A Merry Christmas, Bob, said Scrooge with an earnestness that could not be mistaken. A Merry Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, and I have given you for many a year. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he became a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, as the good old city ever knew, or any other good old city, town or borough, in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh, and little heeded them. For he was wise enough to know that nothing ever happened on this globe for good, at which some people did not have their fill of laughter at the outset. He had no further intercourse with spirits. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us. That was a proper, like, Perry and Croft, you have been watching. What a cast list. That was, uh, I was, I was asked to do the cast list again, but I think you probably all saw that. But what a lovely thing there. Starting with Joe Brand, ending with Mark Gatiss, and uh, in between Eddie Izzard and Matt Haig and so many other people. So that is, uh, thank you. Can I, and it's very nice, by the way, for those of you watching at home, we have some of our late night audience. We have a small, sparse, very social resistance late night audience here. So uh, hello, late night audience in King's Place. Thank you for joining us and thanks very much for watching did you name them all uh also thank you very much to everyone who supports us via patreon we're able to make shows like this and lots of the other shows that we make every single week thanks to our patreon supporters if you are able to support us via patreon that is absolutely fantastic it's been quite a difficult year to keep everything financed obviously because we're not able to do any of our normal live gigs so any help is very greatly received thank you bye-bye